Okay, uh, everybody did real well with this. Everybody got the right answer down here. Uh, so I'm just going to have an X there. Excuse me, X squared plus 3X. And it makes itself a little bit. Got to do a minus here and a minus here. Subtract, and you're going to get an X plus 3. And you're going to get then a plus 1. Gonna get an X plus three, and that's gonna work. Okay. Now, I think I might have seen a minus one there once or twice. So if you got a minus one, make sure you understand how that didn't quite work. And understand if you check it, you want to check these. Okay. So. Using the distributive law, I want to see the distributive law because there's a strong tendency to make errors with the distributive law at this stage of this course. Most of you aren't doing that, but there's still a tendency. So we want to emphasize the distributive law because it's very important for all of them. Okay, so then we multiply this out, we get x squared plus x plus 3x plus 3. That equals x squared plus 4x plus 3, and that checks out. Okay. <clears throat> if you got an x minus 1 there, it wouldn't check out. You have a minus 3x here, so you get x squared minus 2x minus 3. Couple of observations. Again, if you know. For example, if I plug x equals three, negative three in here, I get nine and minus 12 plus three. Okay, now easy calculation, zoom in your head, you can write it down easily, but that would give you zero. So I know that negative three is a zero, so that x plus three has to be a factor. Okay, more likely, if I, didn't know how to factor this, I could inspect and see that negative one, because I'd probably try negative one before I try three, okay? Now, what, what I do is I could plug x equals one in here, I'd get one plus four, well, if I plug a positive number in, all these are gonna be positive, I'm not gonna get zero. I'm looking for a number that gives me zero, so i try negative one. And that's going to give me a one and a minus four and a three, which adds up to zero. So I know that x plus one would be a factor if I divided x plus one into this. Of course, I get x plus three. Then I know what my factors are, and I know that this polynomial is equal to x plus three times x plus one. Now that's particularly useful if you have a cubic polynomial. I didn't do a cubic polynomial. I think we did an example last time. A cubic polynomial that has a zero you can find by inspection. By inspection, I mean, you try one, you try negative one, you try two, you try negative two, maybe you try three or negative three. But if you don't see a pattern to that, and if it looks like it's pointless to try any other numbers, then you probably can't factor easily. It might factor, it might factor over some pretty, you know, pretty fractions. You might factor over some fractional numbers and you might not be equipped to uh, deal with that, okay? I don't think it's a big deal for this course because you're highly unlikely, except in a contrived example, to get a cubic polynomial that even factors, okay? And There are more important things to do than worry about factoring good polynomials. So it's an important thing that if you go on and get your techniques of calculus and so forth, so you have better clues about how to factor things, 
then you'd be equipped, equipped to do it. And if you don't go that far, it's probably never going to make a difference to you in your mathematics or anything else. And it's going to be more important to get into the exponential logarithmic functions, which have wide application, than it is to get into all the details uh, that occur uh, when you're trying to back the problem. Okay, so the bottom line is. This can be a technique for figuring out how to pack a polynomial. It's actually kind of a fun game as long as it doesn't get too involved. Okay, so great lines right along the same path. And I just had a question. How would you check if you have a remainder? Okay. And I, I decided when I was doing this that I was going to do one of these um, to illustrate that. There are things, and also to help the graphs. So let's say I've got, what is the news? When we do x minus 2 divided into x squared minus 5x plus 9. And then all that's going to give us a remainder. So what we get at, which is going to give us x squared minus 2x. And make myself a little reminder here that I'm subtracting this and adding this. Uh, and I get negative 3x plus 9. So then I'm going to have to have a plus 3. Excuse me, plus three here. Sorry, so I'm going to get minus three max plus six. Now I'm going to add this, subtract this, and it's going to give me a remainder of three. Well, that means that my result then is x minus three plus three over x minus two. Because that's what you do with a remainder. Remember the division algorithm that you learned in fifth grade. Okay. You just put your remainder over your divisor. So you could either write that as R3, remainder of three, but if you want to express it as a function, uh, R3 doesn't mean anything in function language. It means you have the three that would need to be divided by X minus two, right? But you can't divide x minus two into three, so you write three divided by x minus two. Okay, now you check. X minus two times x minus three plus three over x minus two. Well, I'm going to ask you to do that. Let's just see what you do with it. Oh, I have a better idea what to tell you. And hopefully what I have to tell you is yeah, everybody did it right. It's a little tricky, so it's possible some people have a little difficulty with it. Okay. Now, thank you, Mr. Okay, so how are we going to do this? Now, one thing that people might want to do is multiply x by this and by this and by this. And then multiply negative two by this and by this and by this. That'd be a valid application of the distributive law. That tends to complicate things. What you want to see here is that your x minus two here matches up with your x minus two here. And if you see that in advance, then you see that maybe what you want to do is you want to express this as x minus two times x, and then minus x minus 2 times 3 is x minus 2 times minus 3 is like minus x minus 2 times 3. And then plus x minus 2 times 3 over x minus 2. Now that comes out x squared minus 2x minus 3x plus 6. 
and then over here, let's just do this in a couple of steps. Let's be careful. You got x minus two over one times three over x minus two. Well, let's just be really careful about what we do here. Over here, we're going to write out x minus two, x minus two over one times three over x minus two equals x minus two times three over x minus two, right? That's the same as x minus two over x minus two times three over one. And that's equal to three. Now, one thing I don't like cancellation in this course until I'm sure people understand the rules for cancellation. And people generally don't. I've said that many times. And some people will just cross out that x and cross out that x and say, okay, we've got minus two times three over minus two, that's three. Okay, that would actually. That would actually be correct in this case, uh, but not you. Um, you can't just cross out these x's. You got to cross out factors, and so it would be valid to cross out the x minus two with the x minus two. And why is that valid? That should have been an x minus two here, three over here. Okay, this is valid because. First of all, this equals this because you multiply the numerators and denominators. This is what you get. Excuse me. And this equals this because if you multiply the numerators here and multiply the denominators here, it gives you this. But in this form, you're dividing x minus 2 by x minus 2. That gives you 1. It gives you 3. You should really think those steps in your head because they're always pretty much the same to make sure it's going to work. Okay, anyhow, because of this, because the fact that the x minus 2 here divides the x minus 2 here, you get x squared minus 2x minus 3x plus 6 plus 3. And that's x squared minus 5x plus 9. And that's exactly what we want to get. Okay. So this stuff here is a little tricky. Uh, again, if you do what's natural to do and what isn't wrong, if you multiply the x through by these things and the negative two through by these things, you're kind of disguising the fact that you've got an x minus two here that'll articulate with this x minus two here and give you something simple when you get to this step. Not that you couldn't recover that, but you'd have to do some factoring to get back to what you want. So if you recognize that really, we're really going to want this x minus 2 to be divided by this x minus 2 to give us 3. Uh, you can do it like this. Okay. Uh, and again, there's really no wrong route as you don't, if you don't make an algebra mistake. Cross out a couple of x's that should be crossed out or make an arithmetic mistake or something. Uh, but this is the easiest way to verify. Okay. Recording here. Okay. So we've got this worked out. And now we're going to move into the idea of rational function. So let R of X equal this divided by this. So there it is. It's called a rational function. Because your numerator is a polynomial and your denominator is a polynomial. That's a linear polynomial, so you think of it as a linear function. Well, that's a quadratic polynomial. It's a quadratic function over linear function. But any polynomial divided by another polynomial is a rational function. And that's what rational functions are. Okay. So we can make note of the fact that this rational function. Since we've divided this into this and gotten this result, 
then it's equal to x minus 3 plus 3 over x minus 2. Um, and you know, what I just said there. Okay, that's right. Okay. So, like I said, if you put this all over common denominator x minus 2, you're going to recover this. Now, my question is we want to graph this thing. So, the first question we ask when we graph is what are the intercepts? The y intercept is easy. If you let x equals zero, if you let x equals zero, you get nine over negative two, which is negative four and a half. So I already know something about the graph. There's an asymptote, a, 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 a y intercept below the x axis, like four, four and a half units below the x axis. Well, we're going to start putting this on a graph in a minute. We're going to ask the question is r of x ever zero? Because that's the x intercepts, right? X intercepts occur when r of x is zero. And what has to happen for this fraction to equal zero? How could it possibly be that the thing equals zero? Okay, we just take a quick look at what if the function was this? Yeah, this is a different function. This function is x minus three over x plus two. Uh, we can immediately spot a value of x that makes this zero. And somebody said, well, x is three, the numerator is going to be zero. And if the numerator is zero, then we expect that the function is going to be zero. Although we've got to check and make sure the denominator isn't zero too. Okay. Well, the denominator isn't zero. The denominator of x equals three is five. So we get zero over five, so it would be zero, okay? So, in this case, y equals zero, x equals three. Since three minus three over three plus two equals zero over five, which is zero. No, right there. Okay, so our rule is going to be If and only if the numerator is zero, <laughs> and also the denominator isn't. Because looking at this expression, you're not sure. That x equals two isn't a zero of the numerator until you do the arithmetic, right? And if x equals two and the numerator happens to be zero for x equals two, then you have a zero over zero, and that's not defined. Uh, let me answer a question. Okay, so uh, again, the numerator is zero and the denominator is okay. What I'm illustrating is if two happen to be a zero of the numerator and also a zero of the denominator, because zero of the denominator is two, then you couldn't say that r of x is zero when x is two. Is the numerator and denominator would both be zero? They aren't in this case, but if, if, if that was the case, um, and, and, uh, then we'd have zero over zero would be undefined. It wouldn't be zero. Okay, well, point is here's the rule. Then only if the numerator is zero and the denominator Isn't zero. Okay. That's pretty obvious. You got zero up here and something up beside zero down here. Zero divided by something that isn't zero is zero. The only thing you can divide by zero that wouldn't give you zero would be divided by zero. You can't divide anything by zero, not even zero. Okay. Okay. Well, 
there we have it. But let's see what we know about this function. Here we have the function. What we want to do is we want to find the intercept. This is always the case for rational function. Y equals zero, and of course that's going to be your x-intercept. Okay? So let's just take a note that's the x-intercept. Y equals zero, because that's where you get the x-intercept. I hope we're used to that, because we can use that again and again. And y equals zero if the numerator is zero and the denominator is. Okay, so it's an if and only if. Y equals zero if and only if. X squared minus five X plus nine equals zero. Okay. You spot a number that would make that zero. Probably not. Can you factor this? No, you won't be able to factor it. So how would you determine whether it could be zero? Let me stop. Okay, so numerator has to be zero. If the numerator is zero, then we set the numerator equal to zero and see if we can find values of x that make this zero. Well, there are two ways to do this. Um, they both come down to factor to uh, solving this equation. So you can attempt to factor this. That's not going to work out. So you use a quadratic formula. Got this negative 11 under the rational. There are no real solutions to this equation. So there are no x intercepts. We got no x intercepts, which means that if we're graphing this thing, the graph can never go through the x axis. Well, let's start drawing a graph here. Not much to put on it at this point, but we know it can't go through the x axis. The x axis is kind of forbidden. Even Take the x axis red to remind ourselves we better never touch that axis when we do the graph. Okay. What happens when the denominator is zero? What do we get? Unfortunately, I got confused on the uh, recording of the message. I didn't get all this recorded. But let's just kind of quickly go over it again. 
And we've seen that if x equals two, r of x is three over zero, that's undefined and so forth. We get this kind of thing. We wanted to look at the long-term behavior as x approaches infinity. We established that if x is a really big positive number, x squared is so much bigger than five x and nine that we might as well just look at the x squared. And x is so much bigger than negative two, x minus two, that we might as well just look at the x. So that we have essentially just x squared divided by x. So if x is a big positive number, x squared is a huge, huge positive number. And you're going to divide that by something close to x, which is a, just a regular big number. And you're going to get a big positive number. And if x is negative, x squared is positive and x is negative, so you're going to get a big negative number. So as x approaches infinity, r of x approaches infinity. As x approaches negative infinity, r of x approaches negative infinity. Okay, the fact that you have vertical asymptote at x equals two, that is coming down like this, and that would have continued on like so, and that over here would have been like so. But what really happens then, since the long-term, long-run behavior, on the right goes up, this thing has to not continue on going down, it has to turn away and go back up. And similarly, this one has to have an asymptote here, but then when the x gets really big in the negative direction, it has to turn down because this behavior. And we get a graph again that doesn't look like this, it looks like this. Okay. Now, we had a longer discussion about that. I'm not going to try to repeat it, um, but that's the idea. So, remembering that when we divide this by this, we get this. We ask what happens to this expression when x gets really big. Well, if x is really big, then the x is way bigger than the three and it's way bigger than three divided by the x minus two. So we're still gonna uh, get big. If x is a big positive number, it's gonna do what we say here. If x is a big negative number, it's still gonna do what we say. The thing I wanna focus on is the three over x minus two. What happens to three over x minus two as x gets really big? Three over x minus two is gonna approach something. What's it gonna approach? Okay, try to pull it out of people get made tired. Hold up. Okay, let's go to approach zero. If X is a million and two, this is three divided by a million and two. Well, how big is three divided by a million and two? It's pretty tiny, right? Pretty close to zero. And the bigger X gets, closer that's going to get to zero. So, That's acts like what? Just the x minus three, the center function zero. Okay. As x goes to infinity or minus infinity, you divide this by negative a million you're gonna get a negative number that's close to zero. Okay, so this acts just like x minus three, meaning that we can add to this graph, we can add a graph of x minus three, which might go through zero, negative three with a slope of one. So it might, Look something like this. Okay. Well, that means that our final rendition of this graph will look something like this, where you have an asymptote with the y 
y equals x minus three function. And over here, that's going to come from below. It's going to come down here, and then it's going to kind of do this. Okay. Now you also get the y-intercept. So maybe there's something wrong with this. Maybe this curve here doesn't really happen. So I'll put a question mark next to this. Let's just see what the known y-intercept is, because we already calculated uh, the y-intercept. If x is zero, y is nine over negative two, negative four and a half, right? So what went wrong here is this was at zero and negative three, because the graph of x minus three would go through zero and negative three. And the y-intercept is actually down here below this curve. Okay. So what happens when you come up down here? You don't really go through the x minus three line, you stay below it. So our final picture of this graph is going to look like this. X equals two is the vertical asymptote. The y-intercept I'll write it zero negative four point five. The x minus three graph. Now, if that's minus three, then plus three would be over here, maybe. And notice we don't have equal scales on the x and y axis. We have implicitly an equal scale on the x axis, a different scale on the y axis, because this is two units on the x axis. This is four and a half units on the y axis. Okay, so the x axis is, is uh, has a different scale on the y axis. So the y equals x minus three doesn't really look like it has a slope of one because of fact that the scales in the x and y axis are not equal, okay? But that's kind of where it would be. It's probably being closer to here, a little steeper than what we do. Still, we get now a good picture. When we draw the graph, we have to have a vertical asymptote here and it has to approach plus infinity on this side. Comes around and does this. And then down here where I didn't leave myself much room, comes up from down here, goes through here, and then we have an asymptote to this thing, okay? This is called a slant asymptote. The flat asymptote occurs when your long division gives you a linear function, as it did here. Okay, it gives it a linear function plus some fraction function. Okay. That happens when the degree of the denominator is one less than the degree of the numerator. The degree of the numerator was two, you had an x squared. The degree of the denominator was one, you had an x. So when you divide this into this, you get an x. Now, if this was an x cubed and this was an x, you'd have an x squared up here. You wouldn't have that linear asymptote. okay? So I wanted to address the slant asymptote of the general procedure for graphing a rational function, which you're gonna want to do for what's the next class Tuesday